So there is a point for all of us, at least once in our life, where we have to start thinking seriously about what we want to do for a career or for a job or for a profession or for an adventure or a vocation or whatever you choose to describe that uh, with. We all have to make some decisions and, and really serious decisions about, well, what am I going to do? Um, some of us make them really, really young, like the, our friend in the picture here. Um, this is a, a young girl who lives in our city here in Champlin, and her father sent us this picture of her and said, well, she wanted to salute you guys for what you do, which was really cool. Um, and it appears she's thinking about becoming a police officer when she grows up. But not everybody makes that decision so young. Some of you are watching this video or in the audience and you're thinking, geez, I'm not sure what I want to do. And you may even be older or later in life, maybe even middle age with a different career. Uh, but you're thinking about it, perhaps, and that's why we're here today. Um, and one of the things we're going to talk about today is this, this young girl, for example, may have complete confidence, I'm going to be a police officer when I grow up. But maybe she doesn't know really what she's getting into. Uh, or maybe some of you are looking at this and saying, I oh, don't maybe I'd like to, but I don't know much about it. You don't know any cops, or you don't have an uncle or aunt or somebody who's in the field. So let's talk about why we're here today. We're not here to recruit you. We are here to give you some accurate information about our profession so that you can make an informed decision about pursuing that profession or not pursuing that profession. So maybe you've wanted to be a cop since you were a young kid like this, and then you're going to watch this video and say, maybe not, maybe that's not for me. And that's OK. We would consider that a success. And some of you will watch it and say, geez, I think I could do that. That might be rewarding. So um, we're going to discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything about our field to give you a real accurate sense of what it's like. Um, and our goal is just to help you make a good decision. So we'll give you detailed information that you may not get anywhere else. And I would certainly suggest anyone who's thinking about this, don't stop at this series. When, if you watch this and you think, yeah, that's interesting, you know, maybe keep looking, keep searching, because it's an important decision and it's an important job. OK, um, I'm going to welcome all of you to Champlin Park High School. For those of you in the audience and anyone watching this video anywhere in the world, whether you're in the Twin Cities area where we are, or you're anywhere in the state of Minnesota or another state, or even in another country, I think you're going to see that much of what we talk about here translates to law enforcement. I mean, literally anywhere in the world, let alone in our country. So um, we will give some specifics about law enforcement in Minnesota, but don't let that limit you, because there, there's similarities all over. OK. so. Let's talk about law enforcement. Let's talk about, I, I use the phrase cops a lot in this presentation. So let's, let's jump to the last point on this, on this slide. What is a cop? A cop is constable on patrol. That's the old traditional definition. Because I'm into history, I've got to put a little bit of history in this. Um, when we talk about policing, we talk about modern policing, which really started in the 1800s with the London Metropolitan Police. That was the first police force in the world that operated on standards of accountability. For example, every officer had a badge number, so that if you had a concern or a problem with one, they could be identified. Um, and those principles are still active today. In fact, if you go to law enforcement training in school, they'll actually touch on all those principles for you. Um, the London police are still out there, and they're still called Bobbies. They were started by Robert Peel, thus Bobby. That's the, that's the phrase that's used. Um, this is Constable Beavis and Constable Thomas. And if you look at Constable Beavis on your right, you'll see in his hand a little patch like the one I'm wearing. I gave that to him when I met him um, in London. Nice guys, and I think kind of illustrates the point that I can strike up a conversation with these guys in another country, and there's so many common things that they deal with um, that we deal with here. OK, I want to talk a little bit about the Champlin Police Department specifically, and only for this reason. We're not here to talk about Champlin. But we're going to use the Champlin Police Department as an example of a lot of the things we talk about. And we're going to have very specific things that you'll want to know if you get into this field. Um, and the Champlin Police are very, very typical for an American Police Department. 
Um, and, and in fact, our department is pretty average in size. We've got 26 officers. That seems relatively small, but there are hundreds of much smaller police departments in our state, for example, and certainly there are some much larger ones. Um, we have typical work schedules. We have typical duties. Uh, our cops have a very cop-like outlook on things. They deal with the same things that cops do all over the place with varying intensities. Um, and we're even going to talk later in this presentation about pay. We're going to use Champlin as an example. And our city's policy is literally, and it uses the word average, our city's policy is to pay us the average of comparable departments. So I think, I think we are a good example to use, and you'll see that come up a lot in this presentation. So let's, let's get into the specifics of what we're going to talk about today. The first thing we'll talk about is what are the pros and cons of the law enforcement profession? And you might be surprised. You might have some preconceptions, um, but we're going to get into some detail of what those pros and cons are. And we're not going to sugarcoat them on either side of that, but we're going to give you a realistic picture of what they are. Um, we're going to talk about, well, what is law enforcement? What do we actually do? And we're going to have a panel of, of cops up here from all kinds of agencies giving you examples of the duties that they perform. We're going to talk about danger and how dangerous really is the job and what forms do those dangers take. We're going to talk about reality versus TV. I, I kind of like this one, and right away when we talked about putting this together, we said we should address this whole TV thing because a lot of people have perceptions about the police based on what they see on TV. I did. There's some TV shows back in the 80s that I watched that got me thinking about, gee, maybe I should be a cop. Not always accurate, but in some ways they can be. Then we're going to talk about the personal experiences of cops. So we're going to talk about, for example, what are the stressors that cops deal with? What causes those stresses? And every, every field, every career has stress. Ours are kind of tip, well, unique, not typical to other, uh, other fields, but typical within law enforcement agencies, we all face some things that, that cause stress. And so we're going to talk quite a bit about, well, how do we deal with that? What's a constructive way to deal with that, and how do we kind of get through that and live our lives? Um, we're going to talk about work schedules. What kind of work hours do cops work? What, what, kind, what are their pay scales? How much do they get paid? And just kind of those personal experiences, what's it like to actually be that person? We'll talk about the public perception of police. And I think that's important because, you know, the public's perception of us has an effect on us. And certainly that perception colors your decision about whether you want to pursue this field or not. So we'll, we'll get into that and we'll even talk about what is reality, how realistic are some of those perceptions. Um, and then the last section, we're going to get into some detail on what do you actually have to do to become a licensed police officer. Now, like I said before, we'll focus on Minnesota, but not just Minnesota. We'll talk about federal uh, law enforcement opportunities, and we'll talk about you know, other states, maybe slightly different than Minnesota, but there are some similarities. So you know, certainly don't tune out if you don't happen to live in our state. Um, and we're going to talk specifics about hiring processes and some of the requirements that you have to meet in order to get hired. We're going to start by having a discussion of what are the pros and cons of a law enforcement career. And let me explain a little bit to you how we lay these out so you understand how we got to the list that we got to. The first thing we did was we went and we surveyed a lot of young people. And we asked them two questions. Questions were, give us your top three reasons why you would consider becoming a cop and give us your top three reasons why you wouldn't consider becoming a cop. In other words, kind of the positive and the negative. And then we compiled all of those results, and we'll go through those with you. And as we do, think about your own perceptions, or what I might call preconceptions, because these are young people who are not in the field. And then the second thing we did is we surveyed our cops, and again, Champlin being a very typical department, we sur surveyed our officers and we said, tell us what you like about your job 
and tell us what you don't like about your job. And we compiled those. And so what's going to be happening through this entire presentation is we're going to contrast and compare those preconceptions of people looking from the outside in with the actual experiences of the cops who are on the inside. And I think what you'll see is there are some areas where they're identical and there's some where they're quite different. So the first thing we did was we surveyed the young people and we said, tell us why you might consider becoming a cop. And we created this word cloud to kind of give you some idea. And you can look at these and see maybe some things you might identify with. Um, I'll go through the longer list for you. By far, the number one response is, well, I think I would be helping people. Um, and then the second most common response was, it would be fun or, and or exciting. And then the third was, well, I think I would be helping my community. Kind of that same helping theme again. So that's a real, helping is real common in this. And re real often, that's a, that's a preconception. I'll get into law enforcement, and I'll help people. I'll get a little bit off topic. When we interview people for police jobs and we ask them, why do you want to do this? Almost every single time they say, well, I want to help people. And, they, and, and I think they're very sincere about that. And then we had answers like, I, want to, I, could, I think I'd be solving crimes and bringing criminals to justice, that whole justice uh, aspect of this. Uh, they talked about protecting people, just kind of a different way of helping. Um, they talked about the pay and benefits being good. I'll give you a little glimpse ahead. We also had a lot of people say, I wouldn't be a cop because the pay and benefits aren't that good. So that's on both sides, and we'll talk about that. Um, there was a lot of feeling of, well, I'll work outside, and I'll be active, and I won't be stuck behind a desk, um, that it would be interesting and insightful. Uh, I like this one. Somebody said, I think it would be a challenge. I think it would build my confidence. Um, Somebody even, uh, oh, work with different people, meet diverse people, uh, have a variety of duties. And some, a couple even said, well, I, I'd like donuts. Which, so we included that in the word cloud there as well. OK. So then the next question was, well, give us your reasons why you would not want to be a cop, why you would not want to get into law enforcement. And far and away, I think about threefold, the most common answer had something to do with danger, the danger of the job. There's definitely a preconception that there's dangers. And there are dangers, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But it was obvious to us we need to spend some time talking about danger in the field. Um, and then kind of in, in order, the, the, the other answers were uh, this stigma that they feel is attached to the police or a poor reputation. Many of them associated that with media portrayals. Uh, the concern about how, what effect this has on your family life, concerns about the hours being long or difficult or unusual, uh, just difficult duties. Um, there was a lot of feeling that, well, if I become a cop, I'll have to deal with bad or difficult or crazy people. Um, and they're not just talking about the police chief. They're talking about people out in the public. Um, there were some who said the pay is too low. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. And there were quite a few that talked about the whole issue of using force. And I'm not sure if, if I would do that or could do that or how I would do that. Um, and then some feeling that, well, I'll be scapegoated. I'll be blamed for problems in society or I'll be disrespected. Um, and then there was a feeling of just the stress overall of the job. So those are the preconceptions from young people so what we did is we tried to combine all those into one graphic, which we're going to actually put up on the side screens here. And we're going to leave those up for the remainder of the presentation. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the preconceptions, both positive and negative, and how they compare to the reality of what the cops deal with and what the cops' life is like. So. Why do Champlin cops like their jobs? And I put a few on this slide, but I'll go through a longer list here. But um, you know, there's a lot of feeling that among the cops, well, I'll read some of these. You know, I like my job because I feel like I, every day I'm helping people. Um, 
I'll read a bunch of these. E every day is different. It's kind of exciting. Um, I feel like I'm part of something important and I'm doing some good, some real serious good in the world. Um, I feel like I have job security and reasonably good pay. Um, there's a lot of responses here that have to do with, I feel like I'm part of a team, and some of the terminology the cops use is, it's kind of a second family. There's some close-knit nature to that work. Um, knowing that my hard work takes a criminal off the street now and then, um, I'm not stuck behind a desk all day, uh, I like helping people in a variety of ways. I, I like this one. I don't have a supervisor looking over my shoulder all the time. Um, I have a variety of tasks, uh, positions, duties, job opportunities. I feel like I have some job security and retirement. Now, I know for some of you in the audience, you're very young. The last thing you're thinking about is pensions and retirement. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about, about pay and pensions and retirement. And if there's a lot of discussions here by the cops or comments about the camaraderie they feel. Um, so there's, there's a variety of things here, and I, I summarized some of them on this slide. Now, I'm going to get off topic a little bit, but I'll come back to this. So if you look at this picture on the slide, that's Matt Smith. He's a sergeant with the Champlin Police Department. In the picture, he's in Washington, D.C., and he's taking part in a memorial bike ride for officers around the country who lost their lives in the line of duty. Uh, and this happens every May in Washington, D.C. It's called Police Week. And there's pretty widely accepted uh, feeling that we should pay some memorial and respect to, to officers who've lost their lives. So it's a big event. Um, I think last year the vice president spoke at this event. So anyway, Matt was there, and that's him with his bike. And when he was in Washington, D.C., he met Congressman Eric Paulson, who's our congressman for our district here um, in Champlin. And Congressman Paulson took Matt and some other officers on a tour of the Capitol building. And then a while later, the congressman called Matt and said, hey, could I do a ride along with you? And he came out and he rode along with Matt working night shifts. So this is the congressman and, and our night shift officers um, at our police department. Um, now, I didn't want to be outdone by that, so I had to put this picture up here. This is me. This is me with the Vice President of the United States, who outranks a congressman, by the way, Matt. And, um, you know, just, just some maybe extreme examples of in our line of work, you actually do meet some interesting people and, and maybe do some things that you otherwise might not. But, far more common than that, and really more of an everyday occurrence is, we deal with regular, ordinary people. And in fact, when you talk to our cops, that's one of the things they like is, well, you're just out there helping normal people. Now, I want to talk about this picture you see on the slide. And the first thing you're going to notice is this picture isn't very interesting. In fact, it's kind of, it's kind of not even compelling to look at. And the story behind the picture is this. I wanted to find a photo that showed cops in kind of a normal, everyday situation where really what they're doing is they're just, they're dealing with people, they're looking at some kind of a problem, whatever it might be, and they're trying to work with these people to, to straighten that, out this problem, whatever it is. What's interesting is it took me over an hour on Google Images to find a picture like this of just normal, ordinary people interacting with cops in a normal, ordinary setting. I found thousands and thousands of pictures of violence and riots and shootings and car chases and crashes and all kinds of really, really dramatic stuff. Um, and it's not that those things don't happen, but they don't happen as often as just normal encounters like this. And yet you never see this. So Maybe the takeaway from that as we talk about what cops like about their jobs is, if the job was all of the super dramatic stuff you see every day in the media, I think the cops would get burned out pretty quickly. I know I would. Um, but what the cops typically experience most days is just dealing with people, all kinds of different people. I have no idea what they're looking at here or what they're trying to straighten out, but this is a pretty typical thing. Not dramatic, but very, very common. Speaking of pictures, let's just talk about a few perceptions, and then we'll kind of get back to the, what the cops like and don't like about their jobs. Um, 
you can find this on the internet in a lot of different formats as far as different jobs and stuff. And what it says is, you know, here's what my friends think I do, and there you see the dramatic police show. Here's what my mom thinks I do, which is counsel little runaway kids and bringing them home, which we actually do. Uh, what society thinks we do is eat donuts, which we actually do as well. Uh, what, my, what my boss thinks I do, I think, is write tickets. I'm not sure what that one is showing. What I wish I did, and that's the cop jumping over the Dukes of Hazard or something. I don't know. That's real exciting. And what I actually do is, you know, pretty routine stuff. Like, you know, you're in the squad car and you're writing a report before you go on to your next call. Okay, let's talk about what the cops don't like about their job. Um, they don't like dealing with a justice system that doesn't always seem to work. And maybe this is the first point where I will say this. We work in a, in a our, our country has a very good justice system, but it's not perfect. And so if you are a person who can't stand the thought of justice not always being met, this isn't the job for you. We do the best we can, we build the best cases we can, we, we seek justice every day, but sometimes we just don't have enough to charge the person. We don't find enough evidence. We don't solve the crime. And if that's something that would really bother you a lot, you shouldn't do this job. Because you, at the end of the day, sometimes you just need to go home and say, well, I did, did the best I could. Um, the cops don't like the media portrayals, <clears throat> excuse me, the media portrayals of the police. Um, I think you probably understand why that is. Um, the cops sometimes don't like feeling defensive. For example, when you go to a party as a cop and there's someone there you don't know and they find out you're a cop, they're going to immediately complain to you about the ticket they got three years ago. Um, you, you, kind of, you, you kind of learn how to deal with that. It's not a big deal. Um, but, but there is this feeling of, well, people are always sort of looking at me like I symbolize whatever uh, adverse contacts they had with the police, past or present. Um, and then they don't always like dealing with negative or uncooperative people. And that is a big component of our job. So, you know, another thing to maybe look at is this. What the police do to deal with a lot of these things is they play a role. I always felt like I was kind of a role player when I worked on the street as a cop, which is I'm there to do a specific job. I need to be scientific about it. I need to be somewhat businesslike and maybe a little bit emotionally detached and just get in there and work the part of this that I need to work. If you are really emotionally attached to everybody and everything you deal with, you'll find that really difficult. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be emotionless or cold-hearted, not at all, and you'll see that when we have some officers up here. That's not, that's not who they are. Um, but you certainly need to be able to go into a situation and say, okay, I'm going to focus on my role in this and not get all personally, emotionally wrapped up in every, every piece of it. Um, that is especially true when dealing with medical emergencies and rendering first aid. Uh, you're going to see some pictures later. They're not super gory or graphic, but there's some blood and there's some crime scenes. And, and what you'll realize is, gee, if I can't stand the sight of blood, I probably can't do that. And that's true enough, but what, what I would suggest is, as you think about a law enforcement career and the whole medical emergency first aid piece is, it's kind of like a doctor, you know? It's a scientific thing. You get in there and you've been trained to, to apply first aid and do certain things, and you just have to view it kind of clinically instead of just personally identifying with every piece of it. Um, I'm going to look just a little bit at the longer list of what our officers listed about things they don't care for um, in their job. Uh, one of these is, I don't like always dealing with the worst parts of society. And there again, you need to have some ability to kind of step back from that. Um, I don't like the changing view of our profession by society. Um, dealing with a justice system that doesn't always seem to work or doesn't always seem to mete out justice. Um, lack of sufficient penalties by the courts, um, calls of violence involving children, and I think we all would agree that's, that can be stressful. So, um, as you can see, um, the cops don't have any trouble listing out the things that they don't like, and I think these are very typical 
One of the things, though, that I need to make note of, and, and if you hadn't caught this yet, you will when I say it, nowhere on this list of what the cops listed that they don't like, nowhere on there was danger. And if you think about the preconceptions that people had about law enforcement, far and away the most common one was, well, I wouldn't want to be a cop because it's dangerous. And yet, in all of these replies we got, not a single cop said, I don't like my job because of the danger. Now, that doesn't mean the cops aren't aware of the danger. They're very aware of it. But it's not foremost every single day on their mind kind of weighing them down. And I think that's the difference. And I think that surprises people sometimes. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, when we saw that result, we came back to our officers and we said, OK, on a scale of, of 1 to 10, I'm sorry, of 0 to 10, how much in danger do you feel on a typical day when you're out on patrol? On a scale of 0 to 10. And the answer, the average answer when we tallied them all up was 3.27. Now, when I show that to cops, they look at it and they say, yeah, that's probably about right. When I show that to people who aren't cops, they're kind of surprised. They think it would be much higher than that. Um, but that's what it is, and so I think we want to have a little discussion about, well, why is that, right? So we asked our officers, well, give us some explanation of whatever your, whatever your scale was, why is that? So I'm going to read a few of them for you. First one, on some occasions it's been higher, but I also felt adequately trained to handle it. Training is a big piece of this, and we're going to talk a lot about training today and how that gets you through some of these. The next one was, on most, uh, most days are pretty low key. There are a few calls from time to time that are somewhat hair raising, definitely. Sometimes that needle does come up from where it's at here. Um, with everything going on these days, I probably should feel a bit more afraid, and at times I do, but for the most part, I feel that I'm pretty safe. And the last one is, uh, some days are worse than others. The media certainly doesn't help. 95% of the time, there's no danger felt. However, you still need to be alert on, mo on even the most basic of calls. And that's a good illustration of something I want to describe. When you, when you look at this needle measurement here, um, it's in the yellow zone. We actually want our officers to be in that yellow zone. Now, when they're at home and they're doing their own thing, Get perfectly relaxed, kind of go down to the green zone where you just, you're not real stressed out. And if you're all the way up in the red, now you're panicking and you're probably not making good decisions. So what we want from cops is every day when they're working, just be alert, just be aware. And if you've ever seen cops out in public, they're usually pretty aware of what's going on, even if they're just having coffee or whatever it may be. because. By training and by experience, they know that part of their job is just know what's going on. Kind of be in that yellow area where you're just not panicking and not stressing out, but you're just aware that, that there are dangers out there. Um, and that's important to know. And a lot of that comes from experience and training. If all you do is watch TV or cop shows or like I talked about the, you know, the Google images with all the violence, um, it may surprise you that this isn't higher, but this is more the typical experience that cops have. Um, let's kind of jump around now. Let's get back to why cops like their jobs, right? And as I said, and this is where the cops' experience really meshes well with the preconceptions that people have, is this, this idea of helping people. So I want to show you an example through a video uh, of our officers in Champlin helping people. OK, I'm going to ask um, Janet Toe, Robert Kennedy Sr., and Robert Kennedy Jr. to join me at the podium, if Robert Kennedy Jr. is cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he is. And I'm also going to ask officers Leslie Johans and, and Jeff Martin to join me uh, here as well. OK, this is, uh, this is issued to Leslie Johans and Jeff Martin, and I'll read it as it's written. Uh, you are hereby issued the Champlain Police Department Life Saving Medal 
for your actions on May 12, 2016. Specifically, at 5.20 that morning, you responded to a call of a five-month-old baby who was unconscious and not breathing. Upon Officer Martin's arrival, the father of the baby met Martin on the street and handed him the baby boy who was limp, was not breathing, and had no pulse. Martin administered chest compressions. Officer Joe Hans arrived shortly after and administrated oxygen. The baby was resuscitated and placed into the arriving ambulance. He was transported to the hospital where he recovered. The Champlain Police Department Life-Saving Medal is issued to a member or citizen who saves the life of another person. It is presented in blue to represent service and protection. This is Officer Martin's first Life-Saving Medal. He also holds two Department Commendation Awards and one Distinguished Service Award. This is Officer Johan's first Life-Saving Medal. She also holds a Distinguished Service Award. And I would like to ask their spouses to come up and pin these medals on them. Carefully, please. <laughs> and I would like to thank um, Robert Kennedy Jr. and Sr. and Janet Toll for joining us tonight. Kennedy Jr. I'm your senior. On the day my son started breathing, I became confused. That was like um, five in the morning. I forgot the 911 number. Because I've been confused, I started looking for the number in my phone. Where's the 911 number? I couldn't find it. All I felt that my son was dead in my hand, completely because he stopped breathing. And uh, my wife was in contact with the police. But these guys were just there on time. The moment I saw the police, I had hope that my son could still live, that my son couldn't die anymore. So as soon as I saw him out, I ran to him with the baby because I, I saw hope in his face, and I knew that my son would still be alive. I want to thank the police department of Champlain for responding, and today we are so proud to be resident of Champlain, and today we are proud that our baby boy is alive, and for every time we look in his face, we always think of this police, that they were the cause that today our son is alive. We want to say, on behalf of my family, we want to say thank you for saving the life of our baby boy. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I think it, that's a really good illustration just of helping people, right? But some of you are watching this and you're saying, well, that's really cool. I'd love to get an award for saving somebody's life, but holy crap, if someone gives me a baby who's not breathing and has no heartbeat, I don't know if I can handle that, right? And I think that'd be an understandable feeling right now. So why is it that, in this case, Jeff Martin was able to take that baby right then and there and do what he did? And the answer is training. That doesn't diminish what, what he did and what, what Leslie did as well. Um, Jeff did the compressions, Leslie did the ventilations, and that got the baby revived. Um, I think that's heroic, but they did exactly what they were trained to do. And I think that's important to know. We don't just throw you out there and say, well, go save people. We train you, and then we train you some more, and then we train you again. Um, this, the picture on your left is one of our officers just last week doing similar training. 
Uh, the picture on the right is from another department, but what those officers have in their hands are these model babies that you actually do this CPR technique on as practice. And they're literally doing what, what our officers did on the scene, which is take them, do the compressions, do the ventilations. And so we do this a lot. We do this regularly. I think that makes it a little less intimidating to some extent. Um, I want to point out one other thing, just a little off topic. So the two officers are on the left of the picture there. Just, it just so happens uh, Officer Martin is the biggest, our biggest guy in our department. He's, he's a big guy. And Officer Johans is our smallest guy in our department. She's a rather petite woman. Um, if, you're if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I need to be a big, burly, strong guy to be a cop, it's not true. You can be. Um, but for that baby, it didn't matter how big or small these guys were, or how strong or how fast or whatever. It was, they showed up on time, they followed their training, and they did what they were trained to do. And so it worked. OK. Um, I want to give one other example of helping people. And I'm going to have um, a Champlin resident come up. And she can introduce herself. And she'll tell you her story about dealing with our officers. Good morning. I'm Francine Siegfried. Um, I've been a resident of Champlin for 13, almost 14 years. Um, we're going to talk, Dave asked me to come and talk to you a little bit about how the police help. And as you can tell by the headlines, there's some, uh, my situation is pretty graphic. I'm going to kind of start from the beginning and, and then kind of focus on how exactly I felt the police helped helped me from, um, from what I remember and, and what I saw. Um, I went to um, pick up my children from my ex-husband's house. He lived in a townhome complex here in Champlin. I was to pick up the kids at 5.30, and I um, showed up a few minutes early, and um, he invited me in, which he had never done before told me the kids were upstairs playing. The house was quiet. That should have been a red flag as well. I just, I wasn't even thinking, you know, I, I just thought, oh, well, maybe we've moved on. Maybe things are better now. Um, he pulled out a knife from behind his back and proceeded to um, stab me multiple times. Um, he thought I was dead. I was able to get out. I started banging on the doors the other doors in the complex, uh, trying to get somebody to help. My cell phone was in my vehicle. Um, and people answered their doors, and they're, I, I can't even imagine from their perspective, they're opening the door at, on a Monday night at you know, dinner time, and here's this person covered in blood from head to toe, screaming. Um, I just felt like nobody could actually figure out how to call for help, so I actually kept going and got out to my vehicle and made a 911 call myself. The police response got there very quickly. I was told later that my call came in right at shift change, so I got police that responded from both shifts. Everybody came to help. It's kind of an unusual phone call to get in our small community of a, a stabbing victim. And I remember the police officers and just my biggest thing was, where are my kids? Where are my kids? I don't know where my kids are. I, and they um, were helping me. Uh, the ambulance came, and a, a female officer was in the ambulance with me, and the other officers were going through, where do you think your kids could be? Who could they? They took my cell phone. Who could we call? Where else could they be? They were, you know, the officers, I was told later, the officers were looking everywhere in that house. They were looking in the attic. They were looking down by the pond, by the townhome complex. Nobody knew where my children were, and you, you've heard the stories. They, we didn't know. He had fortunately left them with his mother, and they were okay, and the police officers were able to call her off my phone and <clears throat> locate my children, and they actually stabilized me in the ambulance and didn't let the ambulance go um, until they knew where my kids were, because they knew that was just the hardest thing for me to process is where are my kids. And the ambulance people are like, we need to get going. And they're like, give us one more minute. We've got to find these kids. One more minute. And um, I was just so thankful that they could find my children. 
that I knew that they were alive um, before the ambulance left. And so this, this officer is riding with me in the ambulance all the way to the hospital and talking with me and trying to, you know, keeping me focused. I'm losing blood and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to pass out. And there, she's just talking to me and talking to me. We get into the emergency room and I'm like, my dog, because I was at the state fair with my friend all day and then went right from there to pick up the kids. And I'm like, my dog's been in the house. I need somebody to let the, let the dog out. My dog's been locked in the house too long. And they actually made that phone call to a friend. I gave him a phone number. They made that phone call to a friend to let my dog out. I'm like, we have to call my parents in Wisconsin. They have to come get the kids. So we made that phone call to my, my parents. They're uh, two hours away. And I'm like, frantic with my dad on the phone. I'm like, I've been stabbed, dad. You have to come here. You have to come get the kids. Come and get the kids. And he's like, I'm on my way. Click. And the officer's like, no, you can't leave it that way with your dad. He's going to get in a car accident on the way here. We need to call him back. We need to tell him that you're stable, that to get here safely. I didn't even think of that. I mean, all, he, all my dad heard was stabbed kids. Boom, go. And so we called my dad back, and she talked to him. She said, you need to understand, she's stable. The prognosis is very good. Get here safely. The children are safe. We're with the children. The children are here at the hospital. Get here safely. Don't get in a car accident on the way here. We don't need that on top of this. So um, I don't think my dad drove the safest on the way there. He made it very quickly, let's put it that way. But I didn't even... I mean, I was very thankful that the officer even thought of that. Like, I just, I didn't even think of what my dad's response to that, the comments I made were going to be. Um, and then just, just being in the hospital, and it was really unfortunate. Both myself and my ex-husband were put in the same hospital, and I was really stressed about that, and it was really reassuring to be able to look out my hospital window and see the, the Champlain police car out there and know that he was with, that there was an officer with him 24-7 while he was there too, that I was still safe. And the officers came and visited with me while I was in the hospital, and um, one of them made a comment that it's, it's so good to see you laughing because I was, I was talking with a friend, and I mean, they, I think a lot of times police officers see the blood-covered person who's been stabbed, but they don't see the recovery process. They don't see that, you know, um, they don't always get to see that even in a horrible situation, things get better. Um, and, I, and I've uh, tried to, to thank them and let them know that I've really appreciated all that they've done and all that they've helped me through and um, I know it was a horrendous situation and um, I just even myself dealing with it I you know Labor Day weekend is supposed to be a great weekend and it's the anniversary of the day I almost died and lo nearly lost everything um, how do I deal with that and I um, drop off a bunch of sub sandwiches for the police officers and cookies and other things and a thank you card every every Labor Day Monday. Just I want them to know that I appreciate, you know, when, when you make that nine one one phone call that they're there for you. It just it, it's uh I'm so thankful that um that people choose to be police officers and, and uh respond to situations like mine. So Okay, thank you, Fran. Um, Fran, we've kind of gotten to be friends, and Fran has helped us with some fundraising uh, specifically to combat domestic abuse. So there always is possibility to do good even after some tragedy, and, and she's a great example of that. Okay, let's, um, let's kind of continue with this, this idea of what the cops like, what they don't like, what they feel like they're accomplishing, what they don't. Um, general question, and, it, and it's in the perceptions, is, gee, I think I'd like to be a cop because it might be fun. Um, so is police work fun? 
Uh, and, and if you look at the cops in the survey we did, they talk a lot about camaraderie and teamwork and, and so on. So here's some cops in Canada. Looks like they're kind of doing the teamwork thing. Then one of them gets in a gunfight. It's a water gun. Um, and then he decides he's outgunned, so he gives up the fight and he, he surrenders or whatever. Now that's silly and kind of frivolous um, set of slides. However, it does illustrate that despite all the violence and stuff you see on TV, this sort of encounter for cops is is a lot more common than you would think, and certainly more common than an actual shootout. And it's just basically an example of interacting with people and having a good time. And, and that's not uncommon in police work. I think depending where you work, there's varying degrees of that, but um, there is a lot of that, you know, you're part of the community, and, and, and so you do have these interactions. Teamwork, um, and this translates all over the place. So the officers on your left are from Iceland, and the officers on your right are from Champlin, and pretty much anywhere you go, there is a feeling of teamwork. Um, Fran's situation is a, is a good example when the cops decided, well, we need to go in and find this guy. We know he's armed at least with a knife, uh, that's scary, but the cops are trained on how to approach that, and they did it as a team. They did it as a group, and it makes it much less daunting when you know that, okay, we know what to do, and we know how to do it, and we're going to do it together. Um, the other question is, do cops ever get bored? Yes, absolutely. And then when they're bored, you see things like this in the parking lot where they've done some artwork to the police cars. Um, again, it's not all just action, action, action all the time. What we don't do is much of this. Um, and here again, I'll throw this red flag up. If this is what you want to do, we don't want to hire you. Um, I know it's silly and it's just a movie, but you know, the idea of the guns blazing and the action, and, and you're gonna have, you're gonna meet some officers today who are very into to shooting guns and very into tactics and have someone here from the SWAT team. Um, but obviously, this is a little bit over the top. But if this is sort of what you're seeking, um, you know, we might not be for you. However, we do a lot of this. This is a, just a, a picture of cops working together to address a problem and come up with a plan. And, and, and again, not dramatic, but very, very common. And we do a little bit of this. This is silly. This is a, a cow that was loose in Champlin. We don't have a lot of cows in Champlin. But for some reason, there was a cow wandering around town. Brian Dahlquist found it, put it in the back of his squad car, and drove around town for a while. And it's known as the Champlin Cow Nine. That's a terrible pun. And we do some of this, wild goose chase. Now, let me talk about that a little bit. We talked about it before. If you can't stand the thought that not every criminal gets convicted, let alone gets caught and convicted within a half hour TV show, um, if you can't stomach that, this may not be the job for you. Um, something else you have to be able to accept, and I think probably in any profession, but certainly in ours, is things don't always go perfectly. We do go on some wild goose chases. We do work on cases that never get resolved. We do try to solve problems in our community that are so chronic that we don't always have the ability to solve them whether those have to do with poverty or race issues or all kinds of behavioral things that we see out in society, we do take part at times in what I would call wild goose chases, which is symbolized by this picture. Um, you have to be able to accept that things don't always work out perfectly. I think that's true in any profession. It's absolutely true in police work. This is something we do quite a bit of. This is just a fairly non-dramatic picture of someone doing typical enforcement. This is an officer who's pulled over a driver for some sort of violation. He's going to take some sort of enforcement action. He's going to be professional. He's going to be polite. But he's also going to take action as an authority figure, which that person may not like. 
We will train him on how to approach that. We will train him on what words to use and the mindset you have to have to do enforcement. But there again, if you just can't stand the thought of being in authority in any way, this is not something that's going to appeal to you. OK, so we're going to leave the pros and cons and these preconceptions up on the screens. Um, for the rest of the day, we're going to talk some more about them. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and we're going to get our law enforcement panel up on the stage, and we're going to talk next about some of the different agencies and duties that we perform. So we'll be right back. <laughs>